All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today for our very special Lead Hers Rise event. Today, we are all here together to celebrate Women's Entrepreneurship Day, and thank you so much for coming. It is absolutely wonderful to see everyone here this morning. Uh, my name is Megan Forrest, and I am the UQ Ventures Manager, and I'm going to be your MC for today. Uh, and I do have a wonderful crew here this morning. You'll see the lovely Ventures shirts, so if you have any questions, feel free to go up to them and ask uh, questions about important things like what food you can get and where do you find coffee. Uh, so today is all about bringing together our lovely, vibrant community of women entrepreneurs and leaders uh, so that we can connect, uh, share and support one another through the various journeys that we're going through. Uh, today we have a really special guest, Theodora, uh, as well as our team from uh, the Brisbane Business Hub. And we have a stellar lineup for our panel this morning, uh, where we'll talk about overcoming unconscious bias. Not an all a tricky topic for the uh, panel to cover today. Uh, we will then go through, once we finish with all the speaking uh, elements of today's uh, event, uh, we'll get kicked into all of our festivities where you can snap uh, a new headshot if you'd like. We, and we have lovely consults uh, from lots of uh, Brisbane-based businesses who are here ready to help you on your leadership and entrepreneurship journeys. Uh, so in celebration of the event today, uh, we do have a little competition running, which we always love, a little comp, uh, where we want to get all of our networks involved with the great things that we're doing here at Lead Hers Rise. So I'd love all of you, uh, if you would have gotten a program as you walked in, uh, we have a LinkedIn post on UQ Ventures that would love you to share with your uh, online networks to let them know all the wonderful women that we have here today for Lead Hers Rise. Uh, and so you can scan the QR code that's on the back there, share the post, and you'll be in the running to win a really great prize pack, which I'm a little bit jealous about. Uh, but one of you here today will get the chance to win that, uh, and we'll announce the winner at 11.30. Uh, and finally, just some of the housekeeping, uh, the bathrooms, you just have to go to the back, you'll see the white curtain and turn right. Uh, in case of emergency, uh, there are two doors to exit out of, the one that you came into and one out the back and the meeting point is down the hill. So basically just exit the building, obviously, if anything really dangerous is happening, uh, and that would be great. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Juliet Alabaster, uh, who is the interim CEO of the Brisbane Economic Development Agency, to provide the official welcome. Thank you, Juliet. Thanks so much, Megan, and welcome everybody to Lead Her's Rise. It's an absolute delight to be here this morning representing Brisbane Economic Development Agency, which is Brisbane City Council's economic development arm. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we gather here today, the Yagara and Tirrabal people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to recognise the really important contribution that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders make to society and their ongoing importance to us here in Australia and globally as well. I'd also like to recognise the University of Queensland staff and students who are in the room, industry supporters, and of course our panellists. We are all very much looking forward to hearing about how we as a society can help overcome unconscious bias. I follow a Canadian researcher and business commentator whose name is Leonard Brody. And Leonard Brody writes about um, global reset moments. And what he means by that is those times in history where something hits us as a society and a community and everything changes. So his research has taken him to look at over several hundred years of history. And what he's found is that these global reset moments, um, in this period, there's an absolute decline in economic activity. And then the economy bounces along for a little while. And then there's a period of great economic boom. And I feel that's where we're at. We're right on the cusp of economic boom. And that is a huge opportunity for absolutely everybody in this room. 
And that is why conversations like the one that we're having today on unconscious bias and what that means for personal and professional development as well as how you succeed are really, really important. As sponsor, Brisbane Economic Development Agency and Brisbane Business Hub are delighted to support events like this that recognise the fantastic women that we have in our community who are leaders, entrepreneurs, mentors, supporters, investors, as well as being mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, mentors to the future generation. BEDA's vision is to help the city's economy through a portfolio of economic development strategies that support local businesses to grow and thrive and also attract new businesses into our economy. We work in partnership with city leaders, industry stakeholders and all levels of government across key marketing initiatives and strategic business opportunities to help drive sustainable economic growth, industry development and increased employment prosperity for our businesses. And we are particularly focused on growing the businesses of our incredible and diverse range of female entrepreneurs and business owners across all sectors. Women represent 35% of small business owners and we want that number to increase. One initiative that we've recently launched is the Lord Mayor's Women in Business Grants that provide up to $5,000 in funding to help female businesses, business owners use new technologies, research, education and other solutions to enable their business to be even more successful in our city. If you'd like to hear more about that opportunity, please speak with Miriam and Emily, who are also in black, um, in their Brisbane Business Hub shirts at the end of today's presentation. Another beta initiative is the Lord Mayor's Business Awards. Brisbane's prestigious awards that recognise business excellence. And I'm delighted to say that this year we had the most female entrants that we've ever had in our 16 year history. So please consider that into the future as well. At BEDA, we work with Career Trackers, a national not-for-profit organisation that creates pathways to support Indigenous young adults to attend university and secure meaningful employment. And we are currently delighted to have two females with us in their summer intern program. We have also just introduced Workhaven to our business, providing employees with an understanding of domestic and family violence. This is a challenging topic in any work situation, but at BEDA we feel it's important to have these conversations within our company with both our men and our women. As your sponsor today, Brisbane Business Hub is an initiative of Brisbane Economic Development Agency and was established last year to help small business and big business to grow and survive and thrive into um, the new decade. The Hub has an extensive network of mentors who support businesses and entrepreneurs across the city and today we are delighted enough to have Theodora Lasuke, Director of Canera, Canaria Technologies and Pro Performance, join us to share her story and insights on, 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 on unconscious bias. Theodora is a member of McKinsey Group, uh, sorry, McKinsey Global Online Executive Panel, as well as the Australian Institute of Company Directors, and has many years' experience in business development, board governance, and capital raising. Theodora specialises in the development and facilitation of strategy, and her award-winning strategic advice has benefited numerous commercial and not-for-profit organisations. Please enjoy your morning. Make sure you reach out to the team from the Brisbane Business Hub to see how they can support you. And welcome Theodora to the stage as our keynote. Thank you, Julia. That was wonderful. I wanted to say that we've got an exceptional panel today that's going to go through unconscious bias with us. Can I just start by showing a, um, a hands of who's ever actually experienced unconscious bias? Good, it's a good topic. <laughs> so I'm gonna go through definitions today because sometimes we, we need a grounding as to what it is we're talking about. So unconscious bias, especially at work, are attitudes that are held subconsciously and affect the way we feel about others and ourselves. 
Subconscious attitudes aren't necessarily as well-formed as coherent thought, but they can be very ingrained. Many people have unconscious biases that have been with them since childhood, which they absorb by absor observing their social, familial, and institutional environments. Unconscious biases can color the emotional and rational responses of individuals in everyday situations and affect their behavior. Keep in mind that one third of everyone in Brisbane originates from a multicultural family. So let's start with gender bias, since there are a lot of women in this room and you would probably understand how this works. It's no surprise that men too often give, are given preferential treatment over women. As one study found, both men and women prefer, prefer male job candidates, so much so that in general, a man is 1.5 more times likely to be higher than a woman when both are equal performing in the same job. So there are ways to avoid gender bias. There's the three women rule. Three or more women are present during decision making. The tendency to um, defer to men dissipates quickly. Be conscious of stereotypes about men and women and whether or not we're perpetuating them in a situation. And only through increasing numbers of women in senior positions can we see a real transformation. To put it simply, women in leadership promote and support women. Name bias. This one is the most pervasive examples of unconscious bias. As you heard, my name, Lusuke, is not easy to pronounce, but my maiden name, Agbalusu, is even harder to pronounce. So this is something that I've been going through all my life, and the numbers bear it out. One study found that Asian last names are 28% less likely to receive a callback from an interview compared to Anglo last names. So ways to avoid name bias. This one is very simple. Learn how to pronounce other people's names. <laughs> Forget what you have learned about certain people from certain cultures being a certain way. And adopt an attitude that if I don't understand it, ask. So, ageism. This one's interesting because it can go both ways. While this, while this may seem harmless, humans are quick to judge and falsely assume things about persons without knowing their full story. Ageism can cause you to determine someone as lesser because of their age. Ways to avoid ageism? Debunk some of the myths about workers of different ages, about millennials, about baby boomers, about how people actually work. Your company should also create a policy that prevents age bias, along with hiring goals to keep age diversity at the top of mind when recruiting new talent. Now let's get into the affinity bias. When you are surrounded by like-minded people, it always seems like a very good thing. It sounds like you're getting along with people, but this is when groupthink starts to come in. Affinity bias is when you meet someone you like and are certain you will get along with them in a team. It's more often than not because that person shares similar interests, experience, backgrounds, which helps you to get into your comfort zone. The challenge with that is getting into the comfort zone is also getting into the death zone. One of the best things you can do is find people who you do not have an affinity with and learn from them. Ways to avoid infinity bias, actively take note of the similarities you share so that you can dif differentiate between attributes that may cloud your judgment and the concrete skills, experiences, and unique qualities that would contribute to your team culture ad, rather than looking for people as a culture fit. And finally, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is all pervasive. So in hiring, confirmation bias often plays a detrimental role at the very beginning of the process. When your first review of a resume or form of initial opinion of a candidate based on inconsequential attributes like their name, where they're from, where they went to school, and so forth, this opinion can follow you into the interview process, into the workplace, and into the home. Some ways to avoid confirmation bias, do not judge a person based on where they grew up and went to school. The GPS mafia is real, but you do not have to perpetuate it. <laughs> Evaluate a person based on where they want to go and their mindset. And never forget where, who someone is and what they're doing on their way to becoming who they are. 
So I'd like to also say that with this panel, we're going to talk a lot about what unconscious bias means to each person and how that works in their own work relationships. I wanted to give you that um, definition setting so you have a very good understanding of what we're talking about and how it affects. So with that in mind, let me call Anthony Ryan up to the stage to get the panel started. I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm the only one that's had to use the stairs so far. <laughs> really um, happy to be here. I'd like to sort of start from an unusual angle, um, where I, in itself, saw a funny side of, of an unconscious bias through one of my good friends. I used to run a program up in Africa called Gone Fishing and it was about taking uh, entrepreneurs, um, extraordinary people, uh, not to give money, but to work within the communities to affect change and use their wisdom, uh, to use their presence, uh, to, to really do some extraordinary things in some of the poorest areas in the world. Very tough weeks when you're in, particularly in some of the slum areas like Kibera in, uh, in Nairobi. Anyway, at the end of it, at the end of those weeks, we used to try and make people feel relaxed. And so we'd take them into the beautiful, stunning <coughs> Masai Mara. And you get to re relax by the Mara River and you share a, a tent with um, one of your fellow gone fishing uh, immersees. Anyway, I was with a guy called Damien <coughs> and you get shown to your tent by uh, the Masai, the Masai warriors. These extraordinarily um, um, gracious guests, and we got taken into this sort of glamping tent, and there was a beautiful king-size bed waiting for Damien and I. And uh, I'm looking at it, and uh, I, I grabbed Damien's hand and said, "This is going to be a beautiful weekend, Damien." <laughs> and at that stage, he's thrown my hand away. Didn't realise he was a little bit homophobic, and. <laughs> and then turned to the Maasai and uh, instinctively started speaking very loudly and slowly to the Maasai warrior. We are two Australian men. We do not sleep with each other. Please move the beds apart. And the Maasai warrior just looks at him very calmly and says, you know, in this beautiful delivery, I, I get it. Um, you're uncomfortable in your sexuality and you'd like the beds put apart. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I, I just looked at him, called him an I idiot, and uh, we got on. That was a conscious bias towards his idiocy. Um, I have the absolute privilege, just a little bit of an insight into myself today. Uh, I'm currently, uh, just for one more day, uh, uh, the CEO of Young Care. For those of you who don't know who Young Care is, 16 years ago, we were the organisation that discovered through um, a tragedy, one of our friends that got MS, um, that once she couldn't be looked after by her husband anymore, uh, that <coughs> they went to look for alternate accommodation where she could live with independence and choice and dignity within a, com a vibrant community. And all, she could, all they could find, uh, Dave and Siobhan went on that journey towards um, what was going to be the end of her life. Um, they discovered with horror that all they could find was aged care and nursing home solutions. And we thought, they thought, it must be wrong. It's got to be wrong. Um, but 16 years ago, only 16 years ago, that's where most young people with disability ended up. They ended up in aged care and nursing homes when at home they couldn't be looked after anymore. Absolute travesty and a terrible insight into a social infrastructure poverty that Australia existed. So that's what we're about. And in many ways we deal with unconscious bias quite a bit. Um, I was in the papers um, only just recently up at Noosa <coughs> where we'd been given a wonderful gift of a block of land up on top of Noosa Hill. You can imagine 
how wonderful this gift is to be able to provide uh, disability housing there and to get some people out of really ins terrible institutional living. Uh, and we thought of everyone would be celebrating that, celebrating the fact that um, people could um, be able to live at Noosa you know, just, uh, and celebrate. Surely where a young person could live their best life. Uh, ended, up in the, ended up in the papers. Uh, and the papers were saying from the, the neighbours of the street, um, why would someone with disability want to live in this street? The street is on top of Noosa Hill, overlooking the water, next to a cafe culture. Of course, why wouldn't they want to um, be living in that street? And I think, once again, that unconscious bias that we all um, get caught up with at different times. It's truly my honour to introduce you to the panel today. And I will refer to my notes, because I've only uh, met our panellists this morning. Um, I'd first of all like to introduce Carol Vale, and actually I'll ask the panellists, as I'm introducing you, could you please just walk up onto the stage? So we'd ask, invite Carol to walk up on the stage. Carol's a Dungotti woman from New South Wales and is the Managing Director of Muruwin, a specialist intercultural consulting and facilitation organisation that specialises in working with a range of clients to enhance organisational capacity by undertaking social research, community consultations, stakeholder engagement, and evaluation services. Can we please welcome Carol? <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, Sissy Ma up to the stage as well. Sissy is the manager and founding director of Grow Sell Your Biz a company that focuses on business growth, mergers and acquisitions, and is also the founder of APAC, Women's Mentoring Circle, with over 1,000 professionals from 18 countries and districts. Can we please welcome Sissy Ma. I did well there because I actually had dropped coffee all over my notes. So, so I, I was trying to fill in some of the dots in the writing. Um, I'd like to invite Sonia Bernhard up to the stage. Sonia is a technologist, investor, speaker, and author who has been on journey from university dropouts to single mother corporate executive to being sacked, setting up her own tech company and entrepreneurial software development firm into a multi award winning company. What a story. Can we please welcome Sonia? Pauline Fatawi, can we please invite Pauline up onto stage? She's the general manager of River City Labs, founder of Chihu, a personal assistant and organiser app, co-host of a Splash of Colour podcast. Can we please welcome Pauline to the stage? <laughs> and last but not least, can we please invite Ashley to the stage? Ashley is the founder of Stripped Supply, a company that aims to solve the issue of young adults with diabetes not getting their medication on time. Can you please join me in welcoming all the, our panellists. So thank you today for joining us on Women's Entrepreneurial Day. I'm really excited. We've already had a little bit of a practice with the panel questions. And I think we should just get into it. Um, the first questions are going to be to Carol and Sonia. And Sonia, I'm going to ask you to, um, to answer, if you can, this first question. And we'll move on to, to Carol. What do you think organisations can do to overcome unconscious bias? There's a key word there, and that's unconscious, which basically means people aren't even aware that they have this bias. So I really think one of the first things that we should, and you ought to go back to your work and your education place, is undertake some kind of activity or exercise to kind of test what your own unconscious bias is. You know, you can have it on anything. I was looking at some of these things the other day. I've got an unconscious bias about weapons. You know, there's just, it's not just about gender, it's huge. So I think one of the first things is everybody do a test. The next thing is we need to agree 
in your workplace and in your social communities that unconscious bias exists. The third thing is something I did my entire career, and I wasn't very popular for doing that, but that was actually pointing it out. A classic example was, it didn't matter what meeting I was in, whether there was a minister in the meeting or whether there was a popular figure, I would, when something happened in that meeting that was unconscious bias, and the classic, as you know, in the meeting is, a woman comes up with an idea and they might be very softly spoken or they might be a new person to the organisation. The idea is ignored until a man mentions it. So I always used to say, that's a great idea. It's the idea when it was first said by da-da-da. And didn't make me popular, but I felt very good that I pointed it out and helped raise awareness. Sonia, that's fantastic. Thank you. Cara, what are, what, what are your thoughts? OK, so firstly, um, let me acknowledge country and pay my respects to the Jagara and terrible people of this, of this place. Um, we, we get to enjoy these places because of their custodianship and wisdom and their caring for country. And so it's, it, it is with that that I want to acknowledge country and thank the, the women from those two First Nations uh, groups for... Um, that I get to, to live and enjoy, enjoy their country. So a couple of things. Uh, Theodora gave an amazing overview of defining what unconscious bias is. So for all intents purposes, if, if the, well, if we were to look at the, um, the definitions that, and the things that she spoke about there. So I grew up on an Aboriginal mission in northern New South Wales. I'm a, um, my family are still there and they're still in other Aboriginal missions across New South Wales. So I certainly lived on, I come from that side of town. The university was on this side of town and always wanting to be the Indigenous kid on this side of town, wanting to go to that university. So if, if, if uh, postcodes or places of where you grow up are anything to go by, then I certainly probably should not be sitting here in front of you today, um, you know, and, and about to share with you some of the amazing opportunities that I've had across my life and um, entrepreneurial journey. So... Um, I agree with Sonia. It is absolutely about calling it out and naming it, but it is about the way that you do that. And if, if unconscious bias is experienced by women in general, then First Nations women, we have to deal with the unconscious bias, biases um, doubly. And, um, and so it, it is about, you know, it is about all of us being responsible and taking the opportunity to do to name it, to find that, to be proactive in identifying strategies um, where we combat this issue. Um, Theodora gave a couple of really good, good um, uh, uh, stats there, and she talked about what was 35% of women are in small businesses. Well, 35% of the indigenous, 35% of the female population in our prisons are First Nations women. So it's these stats. It's that we have to th look at. Um, well, how do we start to use the work that we're doing and working with unconscious biases in pro and providing those proactive strategies to close that gap and bringing our women along with us? I love the other, um, other stat that I think Julian said about the resetting of, of moments in time. And I agree with you. It is, it is, it is a perfect time to be an Indigenous... In, in the context of resetting moments in time... It's the perfect time to be an Indigenous woman in business in this country because of a whole range of things that are happening at the, at the Commonwealth and state levels. And one of those is Indigenous procurement policy, uh, which we'll touch on later, um, which means it's a perfect time for our non-Indigenous uh, sisters to join with us in the journey. And I certainly look forward to that. Um, that was a lot there. I hope that answered your question. That was amazing. Thank you very much. Look, I, I, I get myself caught up in um, unconscious bias. Sometimes I'm not even sure if it's conscious or unconscious, actually. Um, a while back, um, we had a, a young care event where uh, JC from Powderfinger and Cran from Spiderbait did this extraordinary event for us where they were telling the tales of the tour. And uh, Gretel Colleen was the, the MC. It was a wonderful, fun, funny event and insight into the rock culture. Um, but beforehand, I welcomed um, from, yeah, to, in the audience all these young care residents, you know, so high physical disability and electric wheelchairs, um, and uh, everyone clapped and, and welcomed them to the stage, uh, welcomed them as part of the audience. 
Anyway, afterwards, um, we're all sort of basking in the success of a, a great event. And Jamie Lee and Sam, these two beautiful uh, friends of ours who are residents, came up and they've got Farrah disease. And Farrah's a very aggressive neurological disease um, that um, uh, it is aggressive and uh, life, it does affect life expectancy quite a lot. And they came up and started talking to me and said, thank you so much for welcoming us into the audience today. Uh, it was really wonderful to, to, to be welcomed here. And then they just lightly, almost solidly um, slapped me and said, but wouldn't it be great if you didn't feel as if you had to welcome me, uh, or welcome us, and that the audience just expects that people with disability are going to be here. And I realise that even as part of my role as CEO of, of Young Care, I'm as guilty as anyone, even with a, a disability sort of um, unconscious bias. So with that in mind, we talked about that unconscious bias we've, we've experienced, but have you ever caught yourself in your own bias? What was the process to recognise it and to overcome it? Sissy, can I ask you to answer that one? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, everyone hear me? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge country as well. Um, someone from overseas coming to, the, to Australia and, you know, actually uh, thriving and living here and really appreciate the, the long living life of, uh, you know, the First Nations. So definitely for me, it's, it's very important. Um, I mean, I came from China 30 years ago. And for me, um, starting in Australia, there was some bias, right? I can see bias everywhere. And then, um, for personally, um, I, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, well, I should be all, you know, conscious of all the biases that's happening. So I'm, you know, for me, I want to be open to all sorts of, uh, you know, different diversity, open to everyone. Um, but I realized that I actually, I am not, um, you know, I have my own unconscious bias. I did actually take the test. Um, this is about 10 years ago. I, I, I went to the, uh, I was working for Horizon at the time, and we did corporate training on unconscious bias. And everyone did the test. And when I did the test, I was really gobsmacked and I thought I wasn't you know I was open and I was thinking you know very openly but I just didn't know that I had that those sort of bias so I would recommend everyone definitely you know agree with Sonia to do that unconscious bias and call those con unconscious bias to yourself so one of the example I, I can think of was last year I was doing a, a, a podcast, it's called The Capital Raising Show, and I was interviewing entrepreneurs who's raised capital successfully, and I, in like around the, and I was also very actively involved in CEO and meeting with CEO entrepreneurs every week. Yet, out of the first five episodes, I only had one woman in there. I didn't realize that until at that point I thought, Okay, well, that, that is a, a bias there. So immediately I went to my CEO sisters and said, any of you know great entrepreneurs who raise capital? Let's bring them on. So the next five were all from CEO entrepreneurs. So for me, uh, to bring it, you know, the unconscious bias to actually stop yourself to, to think more, to keep an open mind and, you know, just call yourself on it. I think it's very important. Thank you very much. Um, can we just go to you, Ashley? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I was the same. I think it wasn't until um, my unconscious bias was reflected at me and I had a mirror held up to me that I realized that I too had these biases I didn't realize that I had. And for me, uh, one of those biggest moments was when I met my partner uh, five years ago. Um, and my partner has type one diabetes. He's, he has his entire life. And I didn't realize that I had all of these wrong stereotypes in my brain about what diabetes was. And I think a lot of us could potentially um, resonate with this, that diabetes is a sickness for unhealthy people, for un overweight people, and it's, it's caused by sugar, all of which are wrong. And it wasn't until I had Tristan there to, um, to inform me and to tell me what was actually correct that I realised that I'd been holding those stereotypes um, for so long. And um, I was not critical enough when I first heard those stereotypes um, and critical enough in my brain to think, is this correct? Where have I heard this from? Is that, a, is that a good source? And it wasn't until I wasn't afraid to ask questions and to ask people in that position um, what having diabetes was really like. So that for me was a really big turning point of realising um, 
the kind of unconscious biases that I didn't know that I had, because they're unconscious. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Uh, look, I think this is uh, where I'm, I'm really interested in the, in the answers to this next question, because as a CEO, uh, in, my, in my role, uh, I try and be as impartial as possible when, when uh, uh, judging and, and looking and interviewing and things such as that. But what are your thoughts about removing the um, identifying fields from things such as investment pitches and applications? What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are your thoughts, Pauline? Well, that's an interesting one. I think, um, I think mandates are important when it comes to, or, or some form of entry criteria and selection process is important for any organisation who is trying to make a difference and make a change. Because um, in the point that you made, unconscious is unconscious. So you have to make a conscious decision to try and shift it. Because um, if you're in a leadership position uh, and you have the opportunity to, it's, it's a privilege. Uh, so to actually speed up the process, even for entrepreneurs when they're actually seeking capital, I think we have to do very direct and very specific conscious uh, selection processes, panel at members, as well as um, key things like actually purposely selecting a couple of seats for people of different diverse backgrounds. Uh, and that in itself is what gives people the opportunity to showcase and actually change the stereotypes that are out there and some of the um, lived experiences that people have had with their own biases. Uh, and also it gives an opportunity for us to actually change the way the game's played. And, and truly, when you're raising capital, it is like a game. And people with money who put their money down um, especially the people who actually can afford to do it in the tech startup world, they have significant amounts of money. Uh, it is like a game. And, and they have to go, and, and founders on the other side have to um, jump around often like a monkey to perform at that game. And that was the way it was actually designed from the start. Uh, so some of these things are you know, a little bit in the face. I always get grief for it because I do a lot of female founder programs, especially in my role at River City Labs. And I actually have investors who contact me asking me if, if I'm going to actually select men because I have an all woman team that changed. Um, I consciously make an effort for it. Um, and people often ask me, when are you gonna bring a man into your team? I said, when you stop asking me that question. Uh, to me, yeah, I'm being crass about it, um, but it actually needs to be done, and if I have to look like the ugly person to do it, so be it. Yeah. But we have to do it. Yeah. Consciously, though, when you um, just started talking about the fact that you're in, you're in the process of capital raising, there was a lot of energy in the room that just started fighting towards you <laughs> there as well. Yeah. You'll have a lot of people wanting to talk to you. Um, Cece, what are your thoughts on this one? question to me. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard that I actually am in the process of capital raising for a lot of businesses. So I am actually, that's my job basically. I, I represent entrepreneurs and go to VCs and go to family offices and go to, I guess, high net worth individuals or whoever to raise capital for entrepreneurs. And during that process, I'm very fully aware of how different you know, when you go to VCs, if you're a woman, the, then, you know, there is ample research, you know, uh, the HBR, the Harvard Business Review research about, you know, women getting asked questions that are more uh, protective and that men are getting asked questions about that are more promotional. So for women, you know, if you're a, a, a woman going to a, a set of VCs, they're more likely to actually ask you things about history and about risk. And for men, they're more likely to ask you questions about what's going to happen in the future, what is the promise. So, uh, you know, for, uh, if, if, if there is a possibility of actually making it blind and so that the, the VCs don't actually see who's actually pitching. They just see, you know, there, there are also research that says the same pitch, if it's pronounced by a man, it gets more um, buyers, and when it's pronounced by a woman, it gets less. And so there's, you know, ample bias out there. So how do we actually deal with it? 
the blind is definitely a way to go, similar to your, you know, the blind uh, CV, blind interviewing, and th th those sort of things. And but this is a very slow process. It's a great thing for us to think about it. And if we can, you know, we can influence this ourselves. We we should, and this is what we the, at CEO what we do is to take that the whole thing out of it, because you know you are women pitching to women, and you know you basically women uh, investors are more likely to invest in women than men investors. That is, uh, you know, there's ample research. I can give you some numbers as well on that. So um, you know, for us, it's really how do we actually do something that we can in our power to actually change all of those things. Like for entrepreneurs, for example, if you're going for a VC um, interview, if you don't actually you know, know who the, the compensation of the VCs, that's actually going to be, uh, you know, a, I guess something that, that is an, a drawback. So if you can find out, you know, whether there's a, a balance of women and men, and then, then you can, you know, talk to the women about the things that they can actually relate to you about. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's something. And you know, in terms of talking to the men VCs is to actually try to answer their questions about risk in a more pro proactive way, in a more, um, I guess, future-oriented way, and, and you know, basically talk about all this future that you're going to grow into. Cece, thank you very much. Ashley, for the last two years, you've been running Strip Supply. Um, you're a wonderful entrepreneur. What, what advice would you give women who are trying to start into that entrepreneurial space? Oh, that's a good question. Um, something that I wish someone had told me when I'd first started, particularly at the start of this year when the business really started to take shape, uh, is uh, to have more trust in yourself. Um, you don't need to change who you are and you don't need to change your business to fit someone else's mould. I learned really quickly that I prefer to do business a lot differently to dare I say it, my male counterparts, um, I have a much more indirect way of doing business and I need more of an emotional connection and I need more value than just money when I um, partner um, with, a, with a VC or another business. Um, and for me, I, and I think um, as women we do this a lot, we under promise and we over deliver. But when I was having meetings with VCs and investors, when I told them that I think that I can easily convert 30% of the available market, their question was always, well, why don't you think you can convert 100%? Why don't you have faith in yourself? And I said, because I, I can't. I, I can't convert 100% of the available market. And it was that sense of, I didn't have the big numbers that they wanted and the business didn't fit the mold that they wanted. So I wish that someone had told me that um, I don't need to change myself the way that I do business um, to fit other people um, and to fit the way that they do business. Um, you also don't need to take on everyone's piece of advice for your business as well. You, if, if you just grab a notebook and write down everybody's piece of advice that you get and you take it with a grain of salt, um, I think you will have a lot more trust in yourself. Um, just because someone has more experience than you in business doesn't mean they know that your, your business better, doesn't mean that they know your customers better. Was there a, Ashley, was there a moment that clicked for you in, in, your, in your career the way you just went, yeah, I've got this? Uh, I'd like to say yes, but I, I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, I think uh, there's always a lot of self-doubt um, and I wish that it wasn't general for women to have self-doubt, but I think that we do. Um, but something that I always tell myself um, is I remind myself of how far I've come and how logically and practically there's no reason why I can't do this, even if I have a part of my brain telling me that I don't think that I can. Um, and I find that that helps with the, with the self-confidence and overcoming that self-doubt. Thank you, Ashley. Pauline, River City Labs, you know, uh, once again, working a, a lot with entrepreneurs and founders. Is there a, a skill set that you see? Is there something that, um, that, that you believe is sort of uh, part of the DNA that someone is going to require to succeed in that space? Um, I did see the questions before, so I did think about this last night, and I, I'm gonna narrow it down. I'm gonna change your question a bit. And there's, there's entrepreneurs and founders in the general population. Most of them are men. So let's put them to the side for a moment. And I'll speak about the women I've seen because it's more relevant to you guys. Um, 
the female entrepreneurs that have um, been successful, much like yourself, there is the typical words that people say, there's grit, tenacity, persistence, there's courage, confidence, um, and those are all things that exist on a surface level, um, but what they really do have, um, a lot of them, is they've had a lot of struggle and challenges in their past, somewhere along the way, um, and they have a, a complete fearlessness to overcome and create better for them in the future, whether that's for their family or themselves, so they could run away from that past. And this is going a bit deeper, I know, it's an emotional side, but I have thought about this and I speak to a lot of the female founders at a deep level, um, and the male founders too, and they are often the same, they just wear it differently. And, and there is also a, in addition to the fierceness, they are completely obsessed with the problem they're solving. They believe in it with such high conviction that they will move any obstacle creatively and they will not accept no. And they're the ones that make it through. They're the ones who raise series A's and go on beyond that. Capital raising isn't the only way to be an entrepreneur. Of course, the companies we work with at River City Labs are high tech growth um, capacity companies. So they are actually geared towards going to a capital raise at some point because they're building large technology and their goal is to go global. That's the problems that they have to solve. So the ones that we see and the ones I've interviewed as well on panels are the ones that show that fierceness and complete obsession at any cost. But what that means is they have sacrificed family, they've sacrificed relationships, and they've, they've done it and it's a point in time sacrifice. So sometimes to compete in a man's world, you have to do that. And that's, I think, a moment in time now when they're, you know, fast forward 20 to 30 years and we have more females running the world, sorry. Um, I think it'll be a different way that we can show up that will be completely acceptable to be in the space where you don't have to go and play hunger games and the capital raising game. But right now, these women that I'm seeing for now and, and based on the statistics for capital raising and investment and, and for building a successful high growth potential companies that's going to give your investor, you know, 40 to 70 times the return, which is the VC level, that, that, that's, the, that's the traits that I'm seeing. So not necessarily skills, it's characteristics of a person's being. Do you think, do you think that's gonna change quickly? Or do you think, do you see that it's, it's emerging in a different yeah, way or not? I do not see it changing quickly. And the reason for that is because the volume of, stati like the actual statistics of how many, especially tech entrepreneurs, the, the amount of women there are is still minuscule. And correct, we've actually gone back, I think it was 201 years in the UN um, uh, report this year in regards to gender equality. And that's because a lot of the female entrepreneurs, a lot of the female professionals in their households, they're the ones who sacrificed during COVID to do the homeschooling, to quit their job and take a step back, even if they actually were the breadwinner. I spoke to a uh, person who's a CEO of a large FinTech and she actually is the breadwinner in her family, but her husband expected her to do the homeschooling and do everything during COVID. And she did it. So I hope they're not divorcing, but after a session with me, she went home very angry. <laughs> Completely justified. Sonia, uh, you're, you're in the tech world. You've had a great success there. Uh, and you have often um, coined or nicknamed the tech world bro world. Um, how would you recommend for women who are wanting to, to break into this, into the tech world, what, what do you think they need to do? First up, I want to say I love you, Pauline. <laughs> you, <laughs> you spoke to the core of my heart. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking I'm on this panel, but my goodness, I just learned so much from you and you really, thank, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and using some of Pauline's words, yeah, you need that resilience. You need that persistence. Even although the core of you are these other things and you have all that passion. And in my life, I've had all of those dramatic events that depending on the questions might come out. Uh, but really, <laughs> 
well, you know, someone tried to murder me, I've nearly died three times from health issues, you know, fairly dramatic stuff. Um, but it depends how you handle it, that makes a difference. But back to the question, the thing is, in the end, life throws stuff at you. All of those things that you talked about and you've talked about, and you guys have as well, all of that gets tossed at you. What matters is how you respond to that. You can take all of that stuff that we're not yet there and you could just throw up your hands and run away and not worry about it. But if you know that's going to happen and if you have a strong inner self that believes in yourself that you know you're capable of doing this and you know you know yourself. One thing I really recommend there is actually take that time out to understand who you are. Understand where you are coming from, your own philosophy. And you know what that helps you with? How other people perceive you. When you start to understand yourself, you then realise why you react and behave. Sometimes I'm not sure about why I behave in certain ways. But why you react and behave and why other people react to you in certain ways. And that's the only way I was able to get through the bro world to my happy ending. Uh, oh, I'm not gone yet. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so that would be my advice, really. Just, just know who you are, learn more about yourself and be yourself in that world, knowing that it is changing. Yeah. Sonia, while, while you're answering the question, uh, something that um, when I was reading about you, I was a bit fascinated. I'm gonna pass this over to the other panelists, but I'll get you to answer um, the question first. You, know, you were sacked. You mentioned that as part of your story. You've actually had some very impactful, horrendous things happen in your, in your career. How did you get up off the canvas? How did, you, how did you go through that? And what advice would you give to others with regard to when they're facing adversity? Now I love you because that's a great lead into my memoirs where <laughs> called Girls Do It Too, where I actually have a quote in there specifically about that. And that is a saying I've used all the time. And that is... To be successful, all you actually have to do is get up one more time. All that stuff gets thrown at you, but to succeed, don't stay down. Just get up, learn that lesson, or sometimes lots of lessons, and just then rejig, revise what you're doing and just keep going. And um, that's the way to cope with it. What I did when I was sacked, I was like, oh, I spent maybe half a day, really sad and crying my eyes out. And then I went, unfair. I'm good at what I do. I don't have any idea why I was sacked. I never want to be sacked again. So I set up my own company. That's the way to not get <laughs> sacked. <laughs> you can do it that way. And then we get more female entrepreneurs in all sorts of fields. So that'd be my other bit of advice. Carol, what about yourself? What advice would you give in that space? Yeah, look, I have been listening to everything that was, that's being said here and um, I think it's really important that your experiences and all of your spirit experiences, unless, you're, unless you are an Indigenous First Nations woman, it is different from me and my, co my colleague, First Nation women entrepreneurs. Um, I absolutely agree with everything you're saying. However, we have ex we, we we are a how do I say this? Indigenous women, you know, we have to and I'm not I'm not talking about victimhood here. I am not a victim, and I don't expect to be treated, and I never want to be treated like a victim. So when we talk about one of the things that I did um, in order when I first. Uh, was a turning point for me and it went from a government bureau bureaucrat to my own business was that if in stepping into that space, I deliberately sought out the exact opposite to me, which was a white man in commercial real estate that lived in Mossman, Sydney. So I'm a black woman, grew up on a mission, 
on the outskirts of Armadale, right next to the dump. And so I, so it, it's, it's, I, I get what you're saying, Sonia, just get up and go and do it. However, society, it is about, it is, it is important that, that society and that you, and that all of, all of us take responsibility for, for deconstructing col colonial structures. I really think that's critical. Okay, so I, so, so yes, we all experience similarities as women, but First Nations women have to contend with that. And so it's more than just the issues that women in general face. There's that added pressures and, and structures that are placed on us because we are a First Nation woman. Um, and, and so it's not about victimhood. So I just, I, I thought I just need to really say that because I'm hearing a generalisation. I'm thinking, oh, hang on, like, I, yes, that's me, but it's not. <laughs> and I think that's important. And well, It's not coming across as victim. Uh, yeah, and look, all. the other thing is, so last year, our, our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander uh, Social Justice Commissioner, June Oscar, did a national tour around Australia seeking... Um, Seeking, uh, she had conversations uh, in in all different uh, sectors of society of Indigenous society, and she spoke to Indigenous women and girls about things that sorry, that is important to them, and the whole issue around economic empowerment and enabling choice was front and centre. But right alongside of that was being able to close the gap and change the story, the dominant narrative that is out there about Indigenous women. I've gone from a, from a bureaucrat to owning my own business and I tell you, there's, there's power in money, there's power in business, but for, but for me and my, uh, you know, colleagues and cohorts, Indigenous, you know, Indigenous colleagues and cohorts, that's a new world for us in the way that the Western constructed system has enabled it in our society. So it's about, what am I saying? It's a bit about when you said that, you know, the people, the cohort of disabled people came in and everybody said, yay, well, look at you. So it would be a great when a time when it comes to a time when, yep, we, you know, we don't have that, but that's not now. That's not now. And so there is some, there is some explicit activities and behaviours that need to occur to deal with the implicit attitudes and behaviours that I have to contend with as a First Nations businesswoman. So, for instance, when I go to pitch, it is expected that, um, that I, that I um, there's a welfare attitude that, that is thrown back at me. I want you doing this for the good of your people though, Carol, like why do you need money to do this? Well, hang on a second, it is fee for service. When you get me, you get an Indigenous woman that worked for government for 30 years that has tertiary quals, and yet I'm expected to do things for free. I'm not sure if my, my non-Indigenous colleague here next to me would, be, would have that same thing thrown at her. So I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, women, we, 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 women and girls, we have this, this common thread that we have to contend with. But I'm asking all of you to be really conscious of the, the additional um, colonial structures that First Nations women and girls have to contend with when they are there pitching with you and, and developing their entrepreneurial opportunities for you to, ex for you to, um, uh, to, to enjoy an experience as well. Hmm. Amazing, I could listen um, honestly uh, all day for this, but I think uh, we're running out of time and I'm conscious of the fact that we actually haven't um, given you the opportunity to ask your own questions. So, are there any questions from the um, from the audience um, that would like to be directed towards our panelists? I can't see because of the light. Um, so, thinking of your own experiences when you've experienced bias from someone else towards you, have you ever somehow managed to twist it and make it work for you rather than against you? Oh, please let me answer that one. So, I am always given tokenistic opportunities and what I say, and, and you know, some of my uh, Indigenous colleagues and friends will say, like, why are you always, like, they, they, they say no to tokenistic opportunities. Me, I say yes, please, because 
It's about how I work with my, my clients, my colleagues and others to take that, up, that tokenistic opportunity to help them to see... Um, to see the value in having us there, you know, that because because through the conversations they can never say that they don't know. Then, so we talk about the you know the value of of um, drawing on First Nations you know systems and uh, wisdoms that that they can then embed into the work that they're doing, um, and it's about that working with country you know piece. So tokenistic opportunities, are, please let them let them come our way because then we turn out we we help. Um, I think for all of us probably take up a tokenistic opportunity because then though the person that gave us that tokenistic opportunity can never say they don't know anymore. Anyone else on the panel would like to have a crack at that? I'd one? like to say something as well. 100% support, Carol. And the, me being this, you know, little girl from China coming overseas, you know, no, no nobody. And in my corporate career, I always went up to whenever there is a, a women's leadership team, for example, women's, I think they had an executive women's leadership program. I just put my hand up and I sort of fought against 80 other managers in the organization, got, got it, and actually went to work for the uh, executive vice president of strategy and business development. And through that role, I actually got to be able to, uh, be, you know, sit on the CEO panel uh, working with all the executives and became the executive, you know, chief of staff for the CEO. If I didn't take that opportunity, I would not have, you know, ended up there in the end. And that was, you know, sitting on a panel with when we were talking about billion dollar investments and, and stuff like that. So definitely go for it. And uh, yeah, and, and but I think the token is it's like sometimes you, um, when we talk about very much uh, similar to you know indigenous aboriginal and for women from an asian background we have a double whammy of the glass and bamboo ceilings as well um, some numbers you know we have 9.8 percent of women, uh, people in australia that have are of an asian background but only three percent make to the partner stage and 0.3 percent make to the judiciary from the asian background so we need to go the extra step to actually be up there. And, you know, sometimes we were saying, well, if you're not, you know, if you're not invited to the table, make your own table, right? <laughs> make your own table. But at the same time, if you are invited to the table, definitely go. If I could just add there, thank you. That's exactly what I did with WIT, Women in Technology. I was the founder of uh, WIT and I made my own table and that made such a significant value for the rest of my life. WIT actually turns 25 next year and um, yeah, uh, great advice. Good. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, there's a hand raised at the back. Thanks, ladies. All amazing role models. And you have such incredible confidence and resilience that you've obviously built over your careers. I wanted to know if there's any tips or tricks or defining moments that you had to build that confidence and resilience. It's one thing to say, OK, just get up. But I think you need to have that confidence and resilience to even do that. So how did you build that? It's going to be my last wrap-up question, so you've asked. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll have to think of another one now. No. Who would like I, to? I'll, I'll kick that off. I actually talk about this quite a lot because I always used to sit in women's conferences or just conferences in general, especially when I was in corporate and go to the tech conferences. I was the only female there of colour. And I would list them, listen to them explain all of the results you can just go and get. And I would just be sitting there going, yeah, but how the fuck am I going to do that? And I definitely think you have to break it down. And for me, how it started was a very personal journey. So um, maybe oversharing a bit, but I grew up in Papua New Guinea. Um, shout out to my Papua New Guinean in the room over there, uh, Jackie. Uh, and I came to Australia when I was 15. And I used to get bullied every day by this boy at school. He used to spit on me because I was the only person of color there. And I didn't know what to do with myself um, until my stepdad, who was a Jewish Scottish, came and basically picked up the little kid and shook him. Um, so I was taught violence works, um, basically. Um, so the next day when he was about to come and spit on me at the tuck shop line, I punched him in the face. Um, 
and he never, he left me alone from there on. Unfortunately, however, that didn't serve me well in corporate. So when I was in, <laughs> when I was in IT in corporate, and I had 19 years, I worked in large organizations, the Boopers, the HPs, um, the Alliances, and I used to do uh, a very, very male-dominated role, which is recovery. So I used to be the head of the programs that would do recovery of systems that have gone wrong, basically. So I had no life. That's what that means. I had no life, and I worked with men all day. And I, was, I became a bully at HP. So I could fight amongst the best. I was conditioned. I grew up in Papua New Guinea, if anyone knows Papua New Guinea. It's not for the faint-hearted, OK? So it's... Like, nothing in Australia phases me most of the time because I think of what it was like when I grew up. Um, and we're blessed here. Um, but I, I definitely learnt how to manoeuvre the boardroom, the executives, and play the ma man's role. And I assimilated. Um, but that brought out the worst in me, and it was an exhausting task. And so I'm getting to your point. Um, Kaylin. So what I did was I actually ended up resigning from HP and at the, like they put me into Stanford. I did a semester and I dropped out because I thought it was full of shit. And I, I was one of those types of personalities. But what I definitely found was I, I really had this uncomfortable feeling to conform or settle for anything. And I had that through my um, whole corporate career, but I definitely had the wrong delivery and I didn't know how to manoeuvre things. And so what I found was I could have that don't give a shit attitude and, um, and, and really create a lot of enemies and burn a lot of bridges. Or I can do that like the book Art of the War, if you haven't read it, I advise you to go read it, is to understand how people work and how to maneuver around it. So you can deliver and show up the way you want to and people can accept you for who you are or you can meet them where they're at and really try to understand them. I only learned that by realizing, I went to therapy after I kept on, I kept on meeting this Mr. Teflon in every organization I had where he would literally do nothing and I would do all the work and he would get all the praises. Now, I didn't want the praises because I didn't care, but what I didn't want was him getting the credentials for that. It used to irritate me, so I would literally call him a Mr. Teflon to his face. And what I found was that obviously that's not working and it used to create more heartache for me. So I went to therapy and I saw a doctor, a neuroscientist on a panel and I actually went up and I asked her, I said, I think I need to see you professionally. And she goes, I don't do counselling. I was like, no, no, just don't worry, you'll be fine. I said, just let me see you. How, what do I need to do to get to see you? She's like, oh, I do executive coaching for CXOs. I was like, great, I'll buy one of those. So I went and saw her and she literally went backwards. She was doing a Masters of Counselling at the time, so she was on her way to be a counsellor. She, she unpacked what had happened in my childhood and my association with white men and what I thought of them. And I had an extreme unconscious bias to where I saw white men. And for me, they were, it was like red to a bull because I was going to rip you down. But I was going to do it in the art of war style and I was going to win at all costs. But it burnt me at the end and I was the one losing. And so I had to really work that out. And, and for me, it was a very deep soul searching thing. And I still have constant fears and I still doubt myself a lot. Um, but m what I'm trying to say is whenever you have a fear and what I did and what I learned was whenever I have something that makes me a bit my gut uncomfortable and you listen to your body and you listen to the science that's going on here, that means something's not going right and something's not going against what you're experience and your catalogs in your brain has, has stored and, and how you're going to actually next move. And when you are actually lacking and having fear and lack of confidence, what I have learned as a tool is to back it up with fact. So when I'm feeling scared, I'm, I'm capital raising myself for my own startup, um, Chihu. And it's been quite an interesting journey because I have a day job as well and in startup land. And you think I would be able to get money like that, but you can't. And I was like, oh, maybe I'm not cut out for this. I've had moments literally last week where I felt like maybe I'm not cut out for this. And then I had to sort of, I just sat in it and I just let it pass. Because if one thing I've learned is that those thoughts pass because that's how your brain works. So if you just sit in it for a lot and let it pass and then you back it up in the process with fact, actually, let me go look at my history. Can I not deliver? No, I can deliver. Can I not do this? 
you, you literally have to qualify all your fears. If you don't know how to do that, write them down and empty them out of your brain and then back it up with fact so that you yourself can get high conviction more in a statistical way of your own experience. And that's how I manufacture confidence. <clears throat> Uh, Ashley, Ashley, I saw you nodding at one stage. Um, were you just nodding at the whole answer, which was extraordinary? Or, or, or were you, there was something that... There seemed to be a catalytic moment there for you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's exactly how I have to manufacture my confidence, right? You have to say to yourself, have I done this before? Yeah. Have I got up again before? Yeah. Why is this moment different? Why am I doubting myself um, this much in this moment. And I think resilience and persistence really stem from passion and from your why. And doing that work, like Sonia mentioned, in figuring out who you are and what drives you, um, that's how you find your why and that's how you that's how you fuel yourself every day through the moments of self-doubt and through those moments where you need the resilience and you need um, the persistence. And for me, I have had such a privileged life. I can't even hold a matchstick to the kind of challenges that you women have experienced in your lifetime that must fuel you. Normalise yours though. So no. don't normalise your... <laughs> um, but for me, I... I consider myself fortunate because I'm reminded every day when I go home about my why and about my passion. Because regularly I see what diabetes does to a person and regularly I'm reminded, you know, when I'm holding my boyfriend in my arms and trying to bring him back to life and trying to bring his body back to a, a functioning state. I'm reminded that so many people in the world are living like this and it's not fair and I'm the person that can change it. Um, so. I think I was nodding along because I just, I resonate with what you say so much. And I think that when you find your why, when you find your passion, that's what will drive you through the moments when you feel like you can't get up. Thank you. Is there one more question from the audience before we, before we wrap up? We'll take one from the front. Just, uh, well, the microphone's coming, but you might want to yell it out. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, I've experienced unconscious bias as a woman, but also as a neurodiverse person. And as a founder and in my working career, I've lost many jobs. And now what I do is I tell people right up front, I've got ADHD and this is what I need you to do to make things work for me. And yesterday, I had an interesting experience. I've just taken on a new client in the blockchain space and in a meeting, I'm the only woman and I got called a chatterbox. And for a moment I went, that feels like unconscious bias, but I'm gonna let it go. So if you're facing a situation where you're dealing with this as a woman, as a founder, it's trying to be taken seriously, but also you have neurodiversity attached to that, which is invisible for a lot of people. What would you do? That's my question. Thank you. If I would have asked them, why did they say that? So whenever I have, and I've had many, and we all have like those types of experiences, whenever you feel like someone's asked you an inappropriate question, you actually, you actually ask them, sorry, why do, why do you think I'm a chatterbox? Can you just explain that a bit? And let them, give them enough rope to hang themselves so they come to the conclusion that that's inappropriate. In, I guess my, my, my advice to you with that is about, um, so when I introduce myself here, I, you know, I, it's about grounding yourself initially so that then you can be strong within yourself. And so for me, it would be about um, you positioning yourself in that conversation. So, you know, you're positioning yourself there in all that you are and all that you claim to be, whatever that might be. Do you know, does that make sense? And so then you are participating in the conversation or in the discussion. And then like Pauline said, if they start to raise things, then say, okay, let, can you unpack that a little bit for me? So that, and, 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 and what does that mean for the conversation we're having? Um, we're actually, um, I've gone from a, um, a single person business over the last 12 months to having 20 people in my company now. And we, um, I've got two of my colleagues in the room here with me. I'm um, so really, and, and, and the diversity is just amazing. Um, psychological diversity, uh, uh, gender diversity, 
um, all the things that Theodora set up, the, all the, the different things, you know, the, all the, the different types of diversity. And so as a business owner, I've had to be very conscious of ensuring that difference is recognised and celebrated and attended to as part of my business structures. And so I guess uh, what I'm saying is that um, uh, perhaps when you're, you're having these conversations with others, it's about... Um, what is it? It's about, I think there's two things. I, want, I think one, it's about letting the other know that this is, so when I talk about Marwan, I say, this is Marwan, this is who we are, this is what we are, this is who we, what we do. So they know straight up what, what's in front of them, basically. Um, and then the other thing I think is about yeah, being able, being able to, and you used the word graciously before, but not perhaps graciously, but somehow being able to, you know, listen for, for cues and comments to, and then to be able to bring them into the conversations in the context of, well, let's explore that in, the, in, in regards to what we're talking about here today. I hope that made sense. Um, but it's about, it's about not cutting your nose off to despite your face, and that's probably not a good thing to say either, but, but it's about, it's about look at listening for the gems and listening for the, for the gems, both the negative and the positive, so that you end up having a constructive conversation and that you, that you are having the best conversation that you can to achieve your outcome. So yes, it's about you serving the, because I guess for me about, it's about business and entrepreneurialism, serving others. And we, we use what we have to be part of that, that resource to serve others. But in order to do that, we sometimes, well, more often than not, we have to hear things that offend us or are not, you know, should not be said. But, and it, but it's about how do, we, how do we start? It's about us being responsible, taking responsibility, responsibility for helping to change the system. Well and it's about choosing your battles, I guess. I know that's hard. So. Can I just add a little bit? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've experienced that kind of ex experience myself. Um, someone calling me, you know, like this last year, just, you know, just after the COVID came in, you know, asking me to go back to my own country. I said, Australia is my country, you know. I have been here 30 years and longer than you were. That guy was a, a young guy. Um, so <laughs> I, I am Australia, even though I may look Asian or look Chinese, but... That's something, you know, just for me is that um, first you got to call out, call out whatever is happening there. And in work experiences, it might be difficult because, you know, if you are called out on the street, you can just basically counter it. That's not right. You don't have to think about it anymore. But in work, you have to come across them next time, next day, the day after. So what I would do is to actually talk to other people that are similar minded and then talk to them at situations afterwards to say, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. Next time, could you support me in whatever, you know? And just basically because it, it sometimes people are not, uh, you know, it's unconscious bias. They're not c conscious of what they did. But if others are also saying, hey, I think that, you know, let's understand why they're, they're at, why they are, the, you know, the way they are. And then, you know, seek to understand first. And then when you understand, then you are able to actually deal with it the way that you, you know, you should be dealing with it. Yeah, so that's, that's my two cents worth. Thank you very much. I think uh, well, I'm just looking at Megan. We've wrapped up. She's hitting the watch. Um, I'll dutifully um, finish up. Um, audience, we, we have been privileged to, to listen to these uh, five amazing humans. Can we please show our appreciation? <laughs> I'll ask you to, um, we'll move off the stage now and invite Megan up onto the stage. I'll stay down here so I don't cause any uh, traffic jam on the stage, thank you. All right, uh, thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you to everyone on our panel. That was absolutely incredible. I've written down a lot of notes myself. I'm sure all of you guys have as well. This now concludes uh, more of the formal segment of Lead Hurst Rise, and we'll be kicking into our festivities for the rest of the morning. Um, but what I'd like to do is to 
give my heartfelt thanks to the Brisbane Business Hub team for sponsoring this event, without which we would not have been able to pull all this together and bring all this. So thank you so much. Thank you to Juliet who uh, opened, and thank you to Theodora for sharing her insights as well. Um, but before we get into our festivities, we do have uh, a little goodbye that we would like to do here at UQ Ventures. Uh, so today uh, we are saying goodbye to our amazing entrepreneur in residence, Sam Drockel. Uh, I'd like to express our thanks to Sam for all her contributions over the past two years working with UQ Ventures. Can I invite Sam to come up to the stage, please? Let's clap her on. So in particular, I would like to thank Sam for her outstanding support and mentorship with our iLab Accelerator program. Uh, Sam has worked with a lot of our iLab cohorts over the past few years, uh, and I know how much they all really appreciate your guidance and support through the early stages of their business. Uh, and I know Emily, obviously, who's given the gift, is very thankful for all your support as well. So thank you, Sam. Enjoy a little gift. <laughs> Make sure you say hi to Sam today, because Sam's amazing. <laughs> you used to the fans out there. <laughs> Just accept that that's what's going on. And uh, the only piece of advice I would give after what has been a very intense year, but is that the truth actually wins. So keep your integrity, stand up for yourself, and uh, be good. And in the end, that actually does shine and come through. That, that's what I feel like I need to say today. So yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. All right, well now it is time to enjoy the festivities of Lead Hers Rise. We actually have a lot on offer this morning, so I do encourage you all to take advantage of it. Um, we have lovely businesses joining us here today to give consults. So uh, we have Capture Studio over here, who's, we go, uh, who's going to take professional headshots for anyone who would like a new headshot. I know that we were talking about it in the office, that you always need a good headshot. Uh, we have Sally Dwyer, who will be giving uh, personal branding consults if you'd like to spruce up your personal brand. We have the wonderful uni super team here at the back who are ready to give super consults. Uh, and then we have Carmen who is giving uh, consults on funding your business journey. And then finally, of course, we have our Brisbane uh, Business Hub who will be over in the networking area giving uh, general business support advice on lots of various areas. So make sure you take advantage of those. Also, reminder that we do have that competition on social media. So go to the UQ Ventures LinkedIn page, share that post, and I'll be announcing the winner at 11.30. We've Without further ado, enjoy the rest of Lead Hose Rise. Thank you. Thank you.